So, okay, I guess, I guess it's okay. Uh, so, um, uh, I hope you have a good break to now recover, yeah, have some energy. Yeah. So, uh, my lecture course will be about fermions. Uh, and I start, of course, with the ideal Fermi gas uh, for a couple of reasons. The first reason is, of course, it's a simple model, no interaction. But it's not only that, uh, because when we later on we start the interacting Fermi gas, and then you will see that uh, in the interacting Fermi gas, you will see all the time the traces of the properties of the ideal Fermi gas. Yeah, and that's one of the uh, mysterious uh, condensed matter theory of Fermi interacting fermionic system, Landau Fermi liquid theory, is actually described the interaction, interacting Fermi gas as an ideal Fermi gas of quasi-particles. Not completely non-interacting, but the biggest part is just, again, ideal Fermi gas. So it would be nice to, 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 to refresh your memory. I hope you know most of these things. But to refresh your memory about the ideal Fermi gas, and I also point out how one can experimentally identify the if, if in your system is, is some sort of ideal of Fermi gas or not. No? Uh, so for the interacting cases, we can see the repulsive, repulsive case where probably the most interesting things would be Landau Fermi liquid theory and the, the existence of the very strange collective mode, Landau zero sound or just zero sound, which has nothing to do with thermodynamics, nothing to do with collisions which is quite a very special thing. And then we go to attractive Fermi gas and discuss in a great detail BCS theory. How it works, why it is many body effect. I present you a couple of models to clarify these things and then standard stuff about the BCS theory. And we discuss also the connection between all these type of Fermi gases, ideal, repulsive, and attractive Fermi gas. So, but to begin with, I want to give you a summary of the second quantization, not for the purpose of teach you second quantization, because within this very limited amount of time, I don't know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, I cannot teach you second quantization. If you don't know, please do it afterwards. In these comments to the lecture course, to the abstract, I, 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 in, in, if you Google, it is a very good article about second quantization at Google. I just want to have all the formulas that I will use afterwards on a blackboard or in your notes uh, that I can just use then when I need the formula, just use it and uh, yeah, so, and not explain how it comes. Yeah. Concerning the notes, I will provide you not with everything which I draw on a blackboard. Sorry, I'm a bit lazy to put it on a note. But you will have some uh, notes which are rather sketchy, but it covers all the essential ingredients. So you will have these notes. OK, so now let me start, as I said, with the second quantization. So um, so what it is? In a simple language, second quantization and a it's, it's a, a quantum mechanical description of a many-body system not in a normal, ordinary state. We're used to in quantum mechanics, wave function, Laplace and the kinetic energy, etc. But in a space, so it's quantum mechanics, in a space of occupation number of single particle states. in the space of occupation numbers of single particle states. So let me make some more specific what I, what I have in mind. So single particle states, of course, we all know for this, depending on the physical situation that you have, we need a set new, this is set of quantum numbers which characterize the state. Yeah? Most of the time, or practically all the time in the lecture, we will deal with the particles in a very big box, 
yeah, no external potential. That means, as an example, we can take just momentum as a quantum number. And if our particle or atom or whatever has some internal state, like spin or pseudo spin, you call it, then we should add here some sigma or z, which is projection on some axis quantization. And there is something else, then you have to add something else. But it's a set of quantum numbers commuting with the Hamiltonian, of course, of some eigenvalues of some apparatus that commuting with the Hamiltonian and completely determine for you the single particle state. Yeah? So another example would be if you have a harmonic trap, for example, one-dimensional or three-dimensional, then you have, instead of momenta, you have these nx and y and z and maybe some other stuff if the particle says internal. So this is box. This is harmonic oscillator. Different sets, different quantum numbers, but you have them all, and then I'll give you, these are the quantum numbers that can uniquely write from here the single particle wave function. Yeah, this is actually set for all. So these are orthonormal, complete set of single particle, let me use this notation, wave functions. Yeah? And this is what you are dealing with in the course on quantum mechanics when you solve the Schrodinger equation in different situations. Yeah? X here is a kind of co collective variable. Yeah? It can be, of course, position, yeah? because wave functions, we are writing normally in positional space. But then, of course, it can be if you have some internal uh, index, then we have also some, let's say, SZ and maybe some other that, that specify different directions in this extra space, like plus or minus in there. Yeah. So what does it mean that are normal? This, of course, mathematically or formally, these are two identities, two, two equations or two uh, formulas. Orthonormal means that if I integrate or sum integration in terms of R and summation of a discrete indices, yes, so I use this common notation, phi nu 1 star x, phi nu 2 x, that is generic, let me write it, Kronecker nu 1, nu 2. So in the continuum variable, it's of course delta function, Dirac delta. So otherwise, so this integral is only non-zero when the indices are the same. Yeah? And then I normalize it to one. We will walk in a box, so there will be no problem. We just write one over square root of volume. So, uh, and this is one criteria. This is orthonormal. And uh, um, uh, complete means that if I sum over all new, Again, one has to think some means in the end would be summation of a discrete quantum numbers and integration over continuum quantum numbers like momentum. This will come all of the phi nu star x1 phi nu x2. Yeah, now positions are different, but quantum numbers are the same. You get generic, so let me write generalized Dirac delta x1, x2, meaning this is indeed Dirac delta for the continuum variable, like position, or Kronecker delta if we are dealing with discrete indices. So these are two conditions, I think, in the ordinary quantum mechanics that uh, people mention you about this, that the set of, for Hermitian Hamiltonian, the set of eigenfunctions with some proper boundary conditions, the, the set of eigenfunctions form a complete set. So we take, we take it like this. Yeah? So what does it mean then, these um, uh, occupation numbers? Huh? So now we have many particles. Huh? And occupation, that means, oh yeah, important things. We order these states. Ordering the states, single particle states. That would be particularly important for fermions. You will see why, and I give you some very simple exercise to understand how it comes. Yeah, but that means, so now this state, we order them so we know, say, what, which one. Of course, it's easy in one dimension. It's a bit more complicated to visualize in, in high dimensions. But, but typically, if you are not doing Monte Carlo, then it never, never um, creates a problem. If you write something on paper, okay. 
So now then, what is the, the quantum states? Is simply, let me write this cat, n1, n2, etc. This is the number of particles which are in the state phi n1 of x. Because particles are identical, we just need to know how many of them occupy this single particle state. And two, tell me number of particles in this state, phi n2, etc., etc., etc. In total, total number of particles n is just sum over all these nu and nu. Oh, sorry, what am I writing? New two, I'm sorry, and this is new one. So, yeah, so n i in the state new i. Yeah? So that's the convention. If I sum over all what stays here, I get a total number of particles that are in my system. Yeah? So that's all fine. Yeah, and of course, for single particle. Physics, uh, ah, yeah, and then of course, if I have this bit of abstract object, there are very well simple rules: how to build from this one, how to build what you used to many body wave function new one, etc., new n. We have n particles, so it's all quantum states, and here we have x1, x2. Xn. This is very familiar for you, many body wave function in the coordinate space. And there is one to one correspondence between this and this. So if somebody wants a formula, look in the internet or come to me afterwards, I can write down. For Fermions, it's particularly simple for the reason we discuss slightly later. This is what's called Slater determinant. It's a big determinant, which looks very nice when it's right in the determinant form, but if you expand it, that's horrible. Okay, so in principle, there is one-to-one -one correspondence here yeah, between this state, uh, quantum state in the Fock space, what it's called, and this wave function that you normally would write. But you know, you even have 10 to the 5 particles. This is a horrible object. Yeah? You better walk in here. Yeah? So, but this was nice for the single particle non-interacting state, non-interacting case, because if you put particles in these states, these are, if you choose them, eigenstate of your Hamiltonian particle will stay there forever. That will be the eigenstate. But of course, interaction does not respect the single particle states and causes the transition between different single particle states. So therefore, to describe these things, we describe this, we introduce this creation, a new dagger and annihilation or destruction a new apparatus with the property that a new dagger increases n new, the corresponding n new by one, and a new decreases. So here we go from n nu to n nu plus one, and here we go from n nu to n nu minus one. Yeah? And then, of course, you see that there is a very special state, which I call zero, or it is where everywhere stays zeros. Yeah? So in principle here, it's an infinite, huh? so, which is called vacuum state. In some application, this can be, um, so in this case, it's a really working state, no particles. That means you can uniquely define it as saying that all IA nu acting on a working state gives zero. Because there is no particles, nothing to remove. The result is zero. If you try to remove, you get zero. Because there is nothing to remove. Uh, in the many-body physics, when we when we look, uh, so, uh, but this is not uh, uh, so. To, 
don't miss this with a, with a ground state. Yeah? Because in a many body system, ground state is a state with n particles. It's a state, lowest energy state. But it's a vacuum state for excitations, not for atoms, but for excitations. Ground state, by definition, where you don't have excitations. So if you have ground state as a many body particles, this is vacuum for excitations. So this would be true for the ground state if here stays the excitation operator, not the atom operator. We come to this already even uh, today yeah, at some point. So this is a vacuum state uniquely defined. But then, of course, you know, if you know what these guys are doing, yeah, then you can very easily understand how to construct all the other state. Yeah? So therefore, then you, to construct the state M1, M2, et cetera, what you have to do, you have to have your apply new one operator dagger N1 times. You have to apply A new two dagger operator N2 times, et cetera to the vacuum state. And then you populate the modes, single particle states with particles according to these numbers. Yeah? And here's some normalization coefficient. So now we come back to fermions. You know, this was a very general discussion. For bosons, you know this, or photons or whatever, you know what are the matrix elements. So, so now we go to fermions. So these operators, in case of a fermion, satisfy the canonical anti-commutation relation that says that anti-commutator A nu1 with A nu2 dagger is delta nu1 nu2, and all A nu and A nu daggers anti-commute. Yeah, with well, this means. AB means AB plus BA, yeah, plus. Yeah. And this, of course, has uh, severe consequences for our problem, yeah, because if you look at these things for nu1 equals nu2, you immediately get A nu squared equals A nu dagger squared is zero. Yeah, so therefore, this is Pauli principle. So you cannot populate a single quantum state with two fermions. This you know from school when you study the atomic orbitals, et cetera. Et cetera yeah? So therefore, from here, uh, you are, yes. So therefore, in this case, n nu can be only either 0 or 1. That's it. No other possibilities that like makes um, life simple. But on the other hand, the anti-commutators makes life difficult. Huh? So, um, <clears throat> of course, to, to calculate things, I need to know matrix element of these operators, huh? A nu or A nu dagger, for these quantum states, huh? or, or the result of the action. And as I said, so let me apply A nu, uh, okay, dagger to the state N1, N nu, so as I said, it is the state with, let me write it here, n1, n nu plus 1. Yeah? But then comes the number, yeah, which is somehow different from bosonic case. If n nu is 0, we get here 1. But if n nu is 1, we should get 0. So you can write it like this. You can skip square root. You can write square root. Because square root from 0 is 0, square root from 1 is 1. So you can make. But con conventionally, people write like this. But there is a, 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 some unpleasant things. So here stays minus 1 to the power sum over nu. 1 less than nu and nu. One, oh, sorry, and nu 1. So you have to count occupation, and this order is important. This is ordering that I said. This is important. You have to know which states are before. So you have to sum all ends that stays before your uh, chosen mode. 
So all these ends you have to sum up, and they end up with a plus or minus here. Yeah? The same happens for a new n1 and new. It gives you the same number, plus or minus, which is sum over new one, less than new, n new one. And then, of course, we kill the yeah, particles. So if there's zero here, there is nothing to kill, you get zero. If there is one, we get zero. So here you can write simply square root of m nu, which is zero for zero and one for one. And then we have n1, n nu minus one. To see where the origin of this, and this makes life very difficult, even in one dimensions, if you want to calculate some uh, non-local apparatus, yeah? because it will have a trace between them. Easy, what, easy to calculate is local apparatus, and then you look carefully what's the result of the action of this operator to the state. Yeah? First, we get here square root and the plus or minus, yeah? and then we come back, so we have decreased by one, but then with this operator we come back to the same in new, so what you get here would be the same state. And here we'll have exactly n nu. So this is, of course, you know, this is a number operator. n nu, so number operator. Occupation number operator. Measures simply. And you see in these things cancels, well, okay, square, because it's plus or minus, square is always one. Yeah, because it, 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 this operator doesn't change the particles before. Yeah? But if you want to calculate, for example, n nu 1, n nu 4, and n nu 5, you will get the whole string in, in between. Yeah? So this makes these calculations very difficult and tedious if you go to the computer. This is sign problem, so-called sign problem. Yeah? So this is all fine. This we have just the states. We have an operator. So now let me use the rest of the blackboard to describe you how to connect these strange apparatus that works in this space with the apparatus that work in that space, which we're used to. Huh? How we can rewrite apparatus, just not to think anymore about the wave function in positional space, etc. just think only in terms of occupation numbers of a given single particle state. Huh? For this, we need what is called field apparatus. These are psi dagger x and psi x. And they are defined like this. Psi x, I put here hat just to distinguish, make sure that it's operator. Here, don't write hat, so, yeah. So it's sum of all new, uh, a new times phi nu on x. Yeah? So here we have our single particle wave function of the corresponding mode, and that's separator. And of course, the psi dagger, it's a, it's a Hermitian conjugate. So we have sum over nu a nu dagger phi nu conjugate x. These are two definitions. So these are strange objects. Yeah? First of all, they are operators in this space. In, in, in this space, in the Fox space, which is called Fox space, with the coefficients, which are just our ordinary wave functions. Yeah? Operators in an occupation number space or Fox space with the coefficient given by the corresponding wave functions. Yeah? And if you look carefully or, or combine this anti-commutation relation for the A and the operators with the completeness and the normality of the functions psi nu, you will find out that this field operator satisfy this anti-commutation relation. So if I take psi on x1, anti-commute with psi dagger at x2, I get delta x1, x2. Again, it's the same delta as here. So if you have this con continuous variable, it's a Dirac delta function. You have discrete variable. You have Kronecker delta. Yeah? But it's the same delta function as here. 
and all other anti-commutators are zero, huh? which is probably easy to see, easier to see than this one, because this one, for example, again, I said, operator part is only here, and it involves A and A, anti-commutator A from here with some new one, and A from here with some new two, but this is zero. Yeah. So here it requires a bit more algebra, making anti-commutators using this Kronecker delta, and then you up, end up something with this one, and then in the end you get the result. Yeah. So the same is here, because here you have on the operator side only anti-commutator A dagger with A dagger, which is zero. Again, these are just amplitudes. So these are these kind of link between the two spaces. Coordinate space with a wave functions and these operators in occupation number space in a Fox space. Huh? So how now we can rewrite operators which are in, we're used to into this strange language. Huh? So let me start with one particle operators. One particle operators. So the operators that I can write F1, one means one particle, F whatever, it is sum over I equals one to N, if you have N particles in the system, some operator F acting on the coordinates of the i particle. Yeah. Well, for example, this Fi, this is not necessarily function, can be operator, in a simple form, this is, now let me now skip i because I can always add it, minus h bar squared over 2m, and then you have Laplace and acting on the position of particles. You can add here external potential. This is single particle operator. And this is convenient to choose the phi's exactly as the eigenfunctions of this operator. Yeah. So how it works now, the translation formula, let me write it above. Uh, the corresponding operator in the, this Fox space, to calculate, to, to, to transform this, you have to just calculate an integral. Again, integral and sum in case you had discrete variables of psi dagger x f. Okay, let me put here f1, although I guess it's clear that it is one single particle operator. F1 on x psi on x. So this F1 here acts, if I put this psi here, at x on here. Yeah? Because by definition, it's something that acts on the coordinate or whatever generated coordinate. It acts here. It gives you some result. And then you integrate over x with the phi's dagger uh, conjugate that stays here. Yeah? So there is no x dependence anymore because it's integrated out. What is left is just operator A dagger here, from here, and A from here. Yeah? So it's operator that is walk in a Fox space. Very simple formula, very elegant. Yeah, maybe you remind already some second uh, uh, quantized Hamiltonians for the Bose gas or whatever for, for the other stuff. So now we have two particles operator. This I can write F2. It is sum over, okay, let me put half, just because typically it's interaction, and then it just in pairs. I not equals J, yeah, and then you have some function F2 that depends on the position of this particle I and J, and this is comma. This is generic single particle operator. Yeah, of course, what we consider, we will consider, would be this F2 is just interparticle interaction, yeah? Which typically depends on an I minus Xj. So this is typically interaction. So how we can translate this one? 
Yes, there is a, a, a formula which looks very similar to that. Yeah, it is one half, but now we have two particles, so we have two integrals. dx1, dx2, yeah? And now we have psi dagger x1, psi dagger x2, then we have this function f2, x1, x2, and now we have psi x2 and psi x1. That's it. I guess if I give you a, a free body Hamiltonian, free particles Hamiltonian, you will immediately write me what's the corresponding formula for this one. Huh? You have three integrals, three psi dega, three psi, and a function here, f in between. So here there is no summation over particles, right? like what we have here. These are particles coordinates here. There is no particle summation. No? Um, yes, two things. Well, one thing to, 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 to mention here, please order. Keep the order like this. Huh? See? For bosons, it doesn't matter. Huh? Because this operator, for bosons, commute. You can put them. But for fermions, it's anti-commute. Yeah? So if you exchange here, you get a minus sign. So you make from repulsive interaction, you make interactive interaction. And this can have a drastic consequences. Yeah? So order is like this. Easy to remember. Remember the Hermitian conjugation operation for operators. Yeah? So you put a dagger and reverse the order. Yeah? And this order makes this operator in case of this is a, a, a real function and symmetric. This makes it Hermitian. Yeah? So you see, because psi 1 would be psi dagger, comes in the first place where it stays. Psi 2 would be psi 2 dagger, comes to the second, and this opposite. Yeah? So this is, this is sort of prescription. Yeah. Single particle and two particles. And this is, I guess, the whole story about the second quantization of fermions. I want you to tell. It took me a bit longer than I expect, but I think now we have the collection of all the formulas. You know fermionic creation relation operator. You know field operators we will use at some point. Yeah? And you know how to translate ordinary operators into this strange base. Ah, yeah, sorry. I forgot to give you an exercise just to understand, to understand, to understand this minus sign. Yeah? It's, it's always you understand better if you do something by hand, even in the simplest case. Exercise is like this. Uh, let's consider two fermionic mode for some reason. Yeah? Uh, A1 and A2. Yeah? And of course, the dagger operators. A1, dagger A1. A2, dagger A2. Yeah? Then we have our four states in total, right? So we have a state 0, 0, which is, as I said, is our vacuum state. Yeah? Then we can populate this mode, 1, 0. This is A1, dagger 0, 0. Yeah? I populate it, and, yeah. and I can have uh, the third state where I populate the second mode, which is A2 dagger 0, 0. Yeah? And I can populate both. And here I have to be careful. 1, 1, I define it like this. That's the order, ordering. A1 dagger A2 dagger 0, 0. Yeah? So these are for my states. The exercise is find matrix element of, of course, non-zero matrix element, because many of them would be zero, huh? of A i and A i dagger, i equals one and two, between these states. What are the metrics on? Yeah. And then you will see that sometimes you will get this strange minus, exactly according to these rules. And how one do these calculations? Typically, calculations in this case based on, on, on two formulas. Yeah, if you have a, let's say, one, a two dagger, yeah, you write it as minus a two dagger a one. 
Yeah? Uh, if you have A1 dagger A, sorry, A1 A1 dagger, you write it according to our anti-commutation relation, we write it as 1 minus A1 dagger A1. Yeah? And why I'm doing this? Because A1 acting on vacuum state is zero. So the idea is to pull the annihilation operator to the most right when it acts on the vacuum state, and then the result is zero. What's left after this pulling down through? That would be the answer. Of course, you can, in some cases, easier to use the conjugate form of this identity. That means, let me write it here, that means if I have your vacuum state in here, creation operator, I have zero, which has a very simple meaning, because the operator here anyway creates somewhere particles. If there was a particle there, then it gives you zero anyway, but if there was no particle, it creates there a particle, which is state would be definitely orthogonal to the state without any particles. Yeah. So it's quite easy. So try to calculate and uh, convince yourself that this is true. And then you will see why, why these minuses comes. Uh, because it's clear already on this simple exercise why these minuses comes. OK, so now we start going to fermions, to the ideal fermions. Now I have to clean a bit the blackboard. Well, we can use, of course, the other A2, dagger A1 would have the same. I just write one of the, uh, one of. In this case, we would need to change the sum here to be for uh, one bigger than nu. Or... But you will see, you will see, this is exactly the order. You have to count how many particles for operating with this one. You have to count how many particles you have here. And you will see, you will see. You will see how these things appear. So here, walking in here, you don't need to count because there is nothing in front. But operating with this one, you have to count how many fermions is here. So here is no, because then you get no minus. And here there is one, so you'll get a minus. So you will see. But then, then of course, you clearly understand why, why is this, and the generalization is trivial. So this refreshment is over. Let's now go to hopefully also uh, things with a, to a large extent are known for you. OK, let's now go to free fermions. And let me always consider uh, in a box, large box V, yeah. In the end, of course, we want to take v to infinity. Yeah, but anyway, you will always look at the, course, the proper limits. And I will consider the uh, n fermions. But of course, what is interesting to keep the concentration. Also, n goes to infinity in the end. Yeah, that's we go to macroscopic limit. But we keep n over v which is a concentration fixed during this limit. Yeah? Clear. And the considering particles in the box, yeah, I will choose the following. Uh, at the moment, because it's a free fermions, we don't need anything but position. Yeah? When they start interacting, then it would be, of course, important whether we have several fermions or just a single fermions. But let's consider just uh, one species. Yeah, if you have many, you just pile them up. Yeah, just very simple because again we have three that are non-interacting. And let's talk instead of phi nu x, in this case, we choose phi 
P on R, yeah, so nu is just momentum, and our x is just position, because there is nothing else. And this uh, phi p I choose in the following way. It's a plane wave. Of course, you may ask me what's about the boundary condition, etc. cetera. Um, in the end, it would be irrelevant. So, so you will see. You will see. OK. So this is my set of single particle wave functions, just a plane waves. So now what is the Hamiltonian? Because it's ideal fermions, the Hamiltonian is sum over i minus h bar squared over 2m, and then Laplacian acting on the position of the i particles. Ah, sorry. I forgot to ask you a question. Yeah? Let me consider not the box but a harmonic oscillator. And for simplicity, one-dimensional harmonic oscillator. Of course, you know from quantum mechanics that there is a nice description of this system in terms of creation and relation operator, n a a dagger. And for a harmonic oscillator, for a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator, you need just one pair, one a and one a dagger. Of course, in that time, they, they commute, not anti-commute, yeah? like you can see the single phonon modes, etc. So now the question, would it be sufficient to describe many particle system in the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator? Remember, here we need a new and a new dagger. Is it the same a new as in a harmonic oscillator or different? So how many creation and relation operator you need to describe many particle system in a harmonic oscillator? How many? Huh? No. This way is distributed. We can have two particles, three particles, five particles. The, the formalism actually, how many? How many creation, and you have N, you want to describe many particle system in a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator. How many creation and relation operator you have to introduce? For a single particle physics in the harmonic oscillator, we need just one pair, A and A dagger. So if you have many particle system, how many oscillators do you, how many operators do you need? Hmm? Infinite. For every level in your harmonic oscillator, you need a pair. Yeah? So I'll give you this the picture. Yeah? This is single particle harmonic oscillator, and these are levels. The apparatus A and A dagger you study in the quantum mechanics, these are these. They are called very often ladder operator. They just jump from one level to another level. Huh? But the apparatus we need, it just, let's say this is uh, uh, first level, second, third. So we need A1 dagger A1, we need A2. A2 dagger A2, we need A3 dagger A3, because these operators are doing differently, do different things. They change the number of particles on a particular level. You don't jump between the levels like this operator is doing. Yeah? They simply change the number of particles here on this level. That's why you need as many pairs of A and A dagger, as many states, single particle states, you have in your system. In this case, infinite. Yeah. So these, these two don't mix these two operators, because sometimes I have experience that the student mixes them. This operator, they jump you between the levels. In case of a photons, that's sort of misleading things, yeah? because there in a, in a photon, it's exactly here. You have two photons, here, three photons, etc. But generically, <laughs> this is not the case. Yeah? And the simplest examples I always do the students I give, you, I give them a, a, a rectangular box. They write, some of them, write this oscillator harmonic, this harmonic oscillator creation relation operator. It's nonsense in this. So here it's equidistant, so that's why here is no photon, one photon, two photon. But generically, you have to work with this one because they change the number of particles on this, on each level separately. Yes, so in principle, you need infinite number of operators. 
this Fox space vector has an infinite number of states, but fortunately for us, they are sort of grouped at somewhat in the very beginning where the energy of the states is, is relatively low. Yeah? Okay, let's come back here. Yeah? So this is our, so now we know that this F1 is just this one. And now I can write down immediately Hamiltonian in terms of the second quantization. Yeah, that's what I said, H. In this case, yeah, you know that if this operator, F1 acting of our phi P of R gives me epsilon P times phi P of R, where epsilon P is just nothing but P squared over 2M. No? And then you do a very simple algebra based on the orthogonality of the plane waves. If I use now this formula, yeah, plug it in here, yeah, that's the action of my F1 of the phi P, and then I use orthogonality of the plane wave when I do the integration over R, yeah, then the result would be sum over all P, yeah, because it's in, now is our psi of R is just sum over P, a P phi P of R. So what I get here, we'll get epsilon P, that's my single particle energy, A P dagger A P, and this is very simple bookkeeping, sum over P, epsilon P times N P, yeah? because this is N P, operator that measures the number of particles in the mode with the momentum P. That's very simple bookkeeping. Number of particles times the energy, in a, and then you sum over all states. So this is my single particle Hamiltonian. But of course, I want also to work with some number n. Yeah? And n, how would you write operator n in a normal case? Yeah? You have a sum over all i, which is from 1 to n. And what you sum here, unity. Yeah? Each particle adds unity to the total number of particles. Yeah, this is, it, it's kind of stupid formula yeah, because it's just n. I just split it in a very yeah, strange way. But now this I can now use to write down the number operators. Of course, the answer you know. Yeah, you can guess very easily because I said this is number operator, and what's now the total number operator n is just sum of all p a p dagger a p. Yeah, it's just a sum over and P operator. You just measure number of particles in a given single particle mode, and you sum over all modes such that you get a total number of particles. Yeah? So now this is, we want to have this Hamiltonian. To study this Hamiltonian under this constraint, yeah? so now I fix number of particles, but then of course I will switch to a system where I fix the chemical potential, which you know from statistical mechanics much more, uh, in, uh, so, um, uh, convenient way. Yeah? So what is now the, let's study this Hamiltonian. Let me call here zero, put here zero, that just no interaction, H zero. So what do we want to know from this Hamiltonian as a condensed matter physicist or many particle physicists? We want to know the ground state and excitations. That's typically the things we want to know from the system. What's the ground state? What's the properties of the ground state? And what are the excitations of the system? So let's look first. So what we're interested in is the ground state and excitations. Because then we have a complete description of our system, if we know these things. You can calculate any correlation function, whatever. It's all in there. So what's the ground state? Of course, if I have a trial, this N1, N2, et cetera state, and if I calculate the, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian for this state, what I get is, of course, sum over all P, epsilon P, and P, right? 
So these numbers sum of all p. And because epsilon p is just a p squared over 2m, and the number of particles is 6, and np cannot be larger than 1, for bosons, the lowest energy state, which is a ground state, would be then all particles seeds with p equals 0, then the energy is 0. That's BC, Bose-Einstein condensation. For fermions, we cannot do it because we cannot put all, we cannot put even two fermions with p equals 0, just one. Huh? So what we can do, we can occupy with n particles possible lowest energy states. Yeah? And the answer, if you can very easily convince yourself that if I draw, let's say, the picture, this is my momentum space, then the ground state would be that you have to draw here in two dimensions is a cycle, in three dimensions is a sphere, yeah, in one dimension is just a line. You know, let me try to, to do the, the three-dimensional picture with my drawing skills. Yeah. So inside, all states are occupied. So here we have NP equals 1, and outside they all are empty. This is the ground state. Yeah? This is how it looks like. So if this is P, yeah, all these axes, yeah, so this is a PF. Yeah, it's called Fermi momentum. And all this volume, occupied volume, this is called Fermi sphere. Let me don't write Fermi, just say F. Fermi sphere, and the surface here, where P equals PF, it's called Fermi surface. This is one of the basic, most important parts in the theory of Fermi systems. So below, everything is occupied with probability one, outside is all empty, yeah? So let's now find this, what is this PF? for a given n, yeah? and here you see, so here single particle states, it's a simply matter of counting the states that uh, you have in your system. Yeah? So in our case, how can we find PF? Ah, yeah, and also you can write it, PF is mass times VF, some velocity, and this is Fermi velocity. We will also use it later on. Fermi velocity. Yeah. So how we can find PF? We have to go back to this definition. N equals sum over P and P. Yeah. So now I do what, and this NP is actually NP for this case is very simple. Yeah, it's a step function. PF minus P. Yeah, all what is below PF is one, all what is above PF is zero. Don't ask what is at P equal PF. A mathematician won't tell you. And I give you arguments, it can be anything. Yeah? Okay, so, but it practically never matters, except for some very special cases, but not in our case. Yeah? Okay, so I have to calculate this sum. And of course, now to make it life simple, I just take this sort of thinking that I have a very big box, and then I can sort of, what I do, I just replace this thing summation over P in a semi-classical sense. I replace with integration volume integral dP over 2 pi h bar cube. This is my sum over P, and I will do it all the time. Formulas much more easier to write, and they're much more compact when you, instead of all these integrals, you write just sum over P. So you will see it many times during the course, but it's, it's, it's very easy to remember, and it always translates one into another. Yeah? And here I will have step function PF minus P. Yeah? So the calculation now becomes very simple. Yeah? This is, uh, depends on the modulus P, so I can separate angular variables. Let me do it like this. So I separate uh, P squared dP, from zero to infinity, I do it once 
with some details, but then I will skip these details because they're very standard. And then I integrate over direction of P. Oh, this is just spherical coordinates. And then I have my, uh, then I have this coefficient, 2 pi h bar cube. And here I have my step function. Yeah. So this one gives me 4 pi, uh, because it's a full solid angle. Here nothing depends on direction. Yeah. So what I get would be volume, 4 pi, 2 pi h bar cube. And then what is left is the integral from 0 to pf. Yeah, that's the meaning of the step function, p squared dp. And the integral is simple. It's just p Fermi cube divided by 3. Yeah. Volume, 4 pi, 2 pi h bar cube. And I have p Fermi cube divided by 3. Yeah. So now if I combine all the formula, all these numbers, yeah, cancel 1p, then 2, and multiply. So what I get is the following. I get, let me just start, n equals volume, as it should be, yeah, should be proportional to volume. And then we get a p Fermi cube over 6 pi squared h bar cube. Oh, of course, it is more convenient to write it in the following way, that n over v, yeah, so the intensive quantity, which is our density, is p Fermi cube divided by 6 pi squared h bar cube. So you see, pf depends only on density, as it should be, because it's just a counting of states. Yeah? And from here, we immediately find out that pf is uh, h bar, and then you have 6 pi squared n to the power 1 third. So if I know density, I know what pf. Yeah? And you see that this thing is h bar divided by, uh, not divided by, h bar n to the power 1 third. But what is n to the power 1 third? It's an average distance between particles in my system. Yeah? So it is h bar divided by average distance or interparticle separation. No, it's not a mean free path. Here there is no collision at the moment. Mean free path means collisions. Mean free path is where at the which distance P becomes, changes yeah, separation. Yeah, because this, which is n to the power minus one third. Yeah? And this is characteristic scale, yeah? where, for example, for the case of bosons, you have the onset of Bose-Einstein condensation. Particles start feeling themselves either as a quantum particles, bosons or fermions. Yeah, in a boson, you have a very nice phenomenon, Bose-Einstein condensation. Here, you just start forming a Fermi sphere. Yeah? So most occupied with one, and here, zero. Yeah. But important point that this is determined by, so it's a large momentum, it's a large momentum because it's given by the inverse interparticle separation. So this is important to remember. OK, so let's now calculate the energy in the ground state. So in principle, we have now description of the ground state. Yeah? All inside occupied, outside empty, and the, the border is given by the density. Yeah? So let's now look a bit more to the properties of the ground state. Let's calculate the ground state energy. Yeah? So we now plug using our Hamiltonian. So what we have to do, we have to sum over p, epsilon p, which is p squared over 2m, times np, which is again a step function. Yeah? You can have px, py, okay. and pz, because we are working in the momentum space. These are just momentum. 
But in principle, in principle, well, uh, in some other cases like harmonic oscillator, it's uh, well, you can have n x and y and z, but then of course you will have not exactly the sphere, but something, and because it's a discrete variable. So here we have a continuum variable, so we can write a very nice sphere. But of course, if you, yeah. Yeah, so here what you have to calculate is again sum over p replaced by this integral in the volume, volume, and then we have integral dp 2 pi h bar cube, and then we have p squared over 2m, yeah, this is our epsilon p, and now we have step function. So now you do exactly the same as here. Now you can integrate over directions. That gives you volume. That gives you 4 pi, 2 pi h bar cube. And then what is left is 1 over 2m, okay? What is left is integral over 0 from 0 to pf. We have dp, and now we have, was it p squared was here, yeah? And another p squared comes from the energy. So we have times p to the fourth power. Integral is, of course, simple. It's p Fermi to the power of 5 divided by 5. Yeah, so let me do the following thing just to, oh, you get some answer, but let me give a meaning, a more explicit meaning of these things. Yeah? Let me write like this, volume, 4 pi divided by 2 pi h bar cube. Then I will have uh, a two power I take with 2m. I form this p Fermi squared over 2m. And the rest, let me write it like this. p Fermi cube over 3 times 3 over 5. So I divide and multiply by 3. And why did I, I did it? Because if I look here, yeah, so this... is exactly the total number of particles. Yeah? So what I get, I get n 3 over 5, and this p Fermi squared over 2m, which is very often called or called Fermi energy. n 3 over 5 epsilon Fermi, where epsilon Fermi is just p Fermi squared over 2m, for those who are working with the cold fermionic gases, there is another quantity people introduce, K Boltzmann times Tf, Fermi temperature. Yeah, but it's just a different name for the same story. So what is the lesson from here? That if you calculate the average energy, yeah, we divide by n. Yeah? So if I calculate E0 of n, divided by n, that gives me the average energy per particle in my system. This is actually 3 over 5 epsilon Fermi. So in epsilon Fermi, it's at this border. It's very large. So that means the ground state of the non-interacting fermionic system is actually a big reservoir of kinetic energy. It has a lot of kinetic energy in it. Yeah? Compared to bosons, now bosons all see with p equals zero, energy is zero. It's, it has a drastic consequences for the if you add interaction, yeah. Because you know perturbation theory, you have to compare strength for the interaction with the energy difference of your state, yeah. And in the bosonic case, energy is zero, so any interaction is strong. Now in this case, it is not the case. You have a huge kinetic energy. That is why you really have a very well-defined perturbation theory in this case for Fermionic. And that's exactly the consequence. Fermi sphere gives you this advantage. Yeah? And that's why Fermionic Fermi gas, it's a well-developed perturbation theory. Of course, the interaction is very strong compared to the Fermi energy. Then you need a computer and codes to calculate things numerically. Otherwise, you can calculate many things by hand. Okay, you must be skillful in calculating the integrals, but, but you can do it, you can do it. Okay, so that is the average energy per particles in the ground state. And let me know what, the, what are the other interesting property 
you can uh, extract from this one So I can calculate the chemical potential, yeah? So what we have a chemical potential mu, which is the cost to add a particle to your system. It's D E naught over dn. And of course, the answer you should tell me immediately what should be the chemical potential in this case. Where you can add a particle with minimal energy costs. Directly here. At the at the surface, infinitely small. So you would expect that chemical potential is just epsilon Fermi. Yeah? This is ground state, T equals zero. Yeah? And of course, if we calculate things directly, we do get this. Uh, so I should look at this formula, right? So I have to take DDN, then I have uh, three over five, this is irrelevant, N is relevant, and now I have epsilon Fermi, which I remind you depends it's P Fermi squared, but P Fermi squared is given by this formula. So it is H by squared over 2M, and then you have 6 pi squared, and then you have density, which is N divided by V to the power of 2 thirds. So this n you should not forget. Yeah? And if you take this n into account, yeah, you see you have n here, and n to the power two thought, total n to the power five over three, that exactly cancels this three over five. Yeah? So what you get, you can very easily see that it's indeed epsilon theorem. So our physical picture is right, and mathematics in this side, right. The physical picture is quite simple. It's only here. Similar, you can calculate the pressure. Yeah, because particles move quite intensively, you have a huge kinetic energy, you would have a pressure. Yeah, not like in a bosonic case in a ground state, ideal where there is no pressure, particles don't move. So here I would leave you uh, this exercise. Oh, yeah, sorry. You have to use this formula. Yeah, and then if you calculate these things, so now you have to take volume, huh? keeping n fixed. So, so what you get here, I guess, 2 over 5 n epsilon Fermi. Let me check the 2 over here, but I think it's, it's correct. Huh? If I can find, if I can find, yes, yes, right. Yeah. And this is, of course, Non-zero value, and actually very big one, and this is neutron stars. Yeah, they why keep stable against a gravitational collapse. It's exactly this pressure that keeps things. Okay, so um, do I want to say something else about the... No, probably not. Um, we have 20 minutes, right? We have to finish... Okay, good. So that was a ground state property. So now uh, let me go to the excitations. Yeah. Let me go to the excitations. And when we know excitations, we know everything about the properties of ideal Fermi gas at zero temperature. So let's go to the excitations. So this is again our picture. Yeah, so here n is zero, n is one, sorry, and here n is np, and this is np is zero, and this is somewhere excesses if you if you like. So it's a momentum space. Yeah. So how we can excite? We just take particles here, let's say momentum p1 with modulus less than pf, yeah, where we have particles, and put it in a state p2, which is above the Fermi surface, yeah, because here all occupied, we cannot move here. Huh? So here we have an empty space, and here we have a particles. Yeah? And what's the energy change in these processes? Yeah, because it's non-interacting particles, it's simply the change in the kinetic energy of this particle that you move, right? So we have 
P2 squared over 2M minus P1 squared over 2M. And if I have these conditions, and these conditions, this is definitely larger than zero, as it should be for the excitations. Yeah? It should be. Excitations always increase the energy. But let me now do some, at the moment, miraculous manipulations. Yeah? But you see what here what we have, we have a particles here and a hole here. Right? So this is what is indeed called particle hole excitation. In the end, from a completely filled sphere, you create a hole in the sphere and a particle outside the sphere. So name is clear. Huh? But let me now do some miraculous, at the moment, manipulations. So let me write DE in the following way. Let me add and subtract here P Fermi over 2M. P Fermi squared over 2M, yeah? Fermi energy. Yeah? So what I get, I get uh, P2 is larger. So let me do it like this, P2 squared minus PF squared over 2M plus PF squared minus P1 squared over 2M. Yeah. So this is called particle excitations, and this is called whole excitations. Clear why particle and one hole, why hole? Because this is related to P2, yeah, which is a particle here, but this is related to P1, which is a hole here. Yeah? But important point is that uh, this is Fermi's sphere, yeah? that both of them are positive. This is positive because P2 is larger than PF, and this is positive because P1 is smaller than PF. So this is, let me call it EP1 plus EP2. And this is particle excitations, this is whole excitations. Yeah? So why is this plus or minus PF squared? Yeah? This has a very simple explanation. Yeah? So naively, let me consider these particle excitations. Yeah? Because now I split them, so I pretend that they are independent from each other. I can consider one of them, one particle excitation, and a separately whole excitation. Let me first consider particle excitations. Ah, this is B. No? Particle excitations. In a very naive way, how we can create particle excitation? We have a ground state, and we create there a particle. Add, add an extra particle. No? We add a particle with P larger than PF, yeah? because below we cannot add, only there. Yeah? And what would be the energy in this case? So let me call it the state, I don't know, should I call it? No, okay, I, I don't call it, because too many, too many notations is also not good. Yeah? The energy on this case let me specially use a different probably I should okay, maybe maybe let's do it ah no epsilon was okay, let me do it like this. No, 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 no. Okay, energy on P, let me choose P here, would be energy of the ground state of n particles, right? That's what we start with plus the energy of the added particles, P squared over 2M. Yeah? But this is total energy of the system, but we want to know the excitation energy. So we have to compare this energy with the ground state energy of N plus 1 particles, because this is ground state of N particles, but we add one. Yeah? So now we, 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 we went to a different system, which now has n plus 1 particle instead of n. Yeah? So part of this energy is in the energy of the ground state of n plus 1 particles. Yeah? In total, so here, we, by adding a particle, we go now with n plus 1, not with n. 
So to calculate the excitation energy, this is total energy. of n plus 1 particle. But now if I want to calculate the excitation energy, Ep, this is my excitation energy, I have to take this one and subtract E0 of n plus 1. Then this difference gives me exactly what's excitation. No? Because part of it is a ground state energy because you have n plus 1 particles. And chemical potential is actually this one. This costs you the energy to add particles to form a ground state again. So I have to subtract these things. And now if I do things, just a simple writing. Tell me that's exactly what I, I, I get exactly what, what, what I have. Huh? So I will have P squared over 2M minus E0N plus 1 minus E0N. I just rewrite it. Yeah, this was my minus E0N plus 1, and E0N was here, so minus minus is plus, so it's all okay mathematically. Yeah, but then what it is, what is this bracket? change of the energy of ground state by adding one particle. That's chemical potential. This is chemical potential mu, which is in our case epsilon fermi, which is P fermi squared over 2m. So what you get, indeed, for particle excitations, you get this formula if you think carefully. Yeah? Take into account also the change of a particle's number. The same is for the whole excitation. Yeah, when you have a whole excitation, we subtract. So the energy in this case is the energy of the ground state of n particles. But we now subtract the particle. We get minus p squared over 2m. And of course, in this case, p is below p fermi. Otherwise, there is nothing to subtract, to take out. Yeah? But this is again, so here we have n minus one particle. So here we have n minus one particle. So to understand what is this in the, in the so we have to compare it with the ground state of n minus one particle yeah, to find out what's indeed the excitation energy. Yeah? So therefore, in this case, Ep would be this E on P minus E zero n minus one. That's excitation energy. It's exactly excitation energy. And if you do things carefully, what you get E zero of n minus E zero n minus one minus p squared over 2m. Yeah? And again, you recognize here the chemical potential. Actually, nuclear people develop this machinery, and they actually have to define this mu plus, mu minus, because for n is not very large. Yeah? This can be this. You see with n, n minus 1, and here n plus 1, n. Uh, they could be different in the order 1 over n. And if, one over, if, if n is some, I don't know, 100, for some reason could be interesting. Yeah, because in, yeah, but in, if you have a million, that's already, I guess, beyond the, any interesting sort of thing. Yeah? And then indeed it's a mu, which is again our epsilon fermi, and our p fermi squared over 2m. Yeah, so that's why what you get is exactly uh, what we have there. Yeah, it is this P Fermi squared minus PF divided by 2M. And now it's also positive because P is below PF. So therefore, single particle excitation
which is particle excitations or whole excitations, has the following dispersion. When P is larger than PF, this is particle excitations. And P smaller than PF, this is whole excitation. Let me now do the final. I think I have enough time, 10 minutes. No? So you see, excitations here already here are not identical to initial excitation operator, as you will see. Are not identical, even in this simple case, to the initial creation annihilation operator. Yeah? Because here, we have to add particles. So our operator that is related to the creation of excitations is creation operator. We add any particle. And here, it's opposite. We took a particle out of the system. So therefore, excitation operator here is annihilation operator. And in this case, this is the simplest example. Now I diagonalize your Hamiltonian, which is diagonal from the very beginning, but in slightly different language. So you will see the first example of the Bogolubov transformation we will use afterwards for the BCS pairing. Yeah? Let me write now here diagonalization of this free fermionic operator. Yeah? Sounds a bit strange because free fermionic operator is already diagonal. Sorry, I, I erase it. It looks like diagonal. Okay. That's why I put in quotes diagonalization. Yeah. So I add here particles and subtract particles. Yeah. So therefore, it's convenient go from H, because we change number, of, go to, you know this trick, H minus mu n. Yeah. This mu is exactly will take care about these things. Yeah, because it also measures the number of particles. And add and subtract chemical potential depending what you do. Yeah, if you add particle, and subtract chemical potential, and we are here, yeah? And if you subtract the particles, at add extra, and we are here with a plus, yeah? So it is sum over P, P squared minus uh, epsilon P, okay, P squared over 2M AP, Dega AP minus mu sum over P AP Dega AP. Or I can combine it, of course, and write as sum over P because T equals zero. I know that mu is just a P Fermi squared AP Dega AP. That's rewritten Hamiltonian. Okay, and I will try this one to, to see when I can. Okay. So, but what I said, now we want to diagonalize it to find the, we want to write it, what it means diagonalization, you write it in the form of E zero. Well, here I can put tilde because I subtract something. Let me put tilde to distinguish from this E which we had before. Yeah, plus, but it would be, I guess, almost the same. Plus something, E P, Alpha P dega alpha P. No, it's inconvenient. No, 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 no. I have, I have, I have, I have here some paper. Yeah? This is what it means diagonalization. You write it in this form where alpha P are alpha P, alpha P dega. These are excitation operator such that the ground state does not contain them. In our case, ground state, I especially write the ground state not zero, because we have particles. It's not a vacuum. But it's a ground state. In our case, it's just a field Fermi sphere. Yeah, this is our ground state. This is our ground state. 
And excitations, when I add, excite, add this annihilation operator on the ground state, I should get zero. So what are these alphas in this case? I can write alpha p in the form of, I know, okay, let me write creation in the first place. That's intuitively easier. We know then p is larger pf, we create excitation by adding a particle. Huh? So I write here up a p dagger. Yeah? And if I below, if p is below p Fermi, I should remove particles. So I write here vp a minus p. And minus, because if I remove the particles with p, with minus p, that means I left the system with plus p. Yeah? So that means here the coval p. Yeah? So this excitation with momentum p, and I can do it twice, two ways. I add a particle with momentum p, or I remove the particle with momentum minus p. In both cases, what is left has a momentum p. If, of course, the ground state has zero momentum, which one? Okay. And, of course, I write alpha p is just up a p plus v p a minus p dagger, and I assume this u and p is to be a real. So the answer is u p is just step function p minus p f, and v p is a step function p f minus p. So this is one outside the Fermi surface where we can add the particles because below we cannot. And this is unity below the Fermi surface where we can remove the particle and zero outside. This is our excitations operator. And you can check that if you add this operator on a field Fermi C, you always get zero. Yeah? Because these things, when you re remove the particles, it's non-zero for P above P Fermi where there is no particles. Yeah? And this one, when you add the particle, it is non-zero only when you are inside the Fermi surface. They're all occupied and you cannot add a particle. So now the question is how we can write now Hamiltonian in this form. Yeah, that's very simple. And this is the last for today. So the Hamiltonian, I have split P for P larger than PF, yeah, where I know I, it's, all, it's all okay. Yeah. So here I will have P squared minus PF squared over 2M, A dagger P, A, P. But now I have another spot with P less than PF, where I have p squared minus pf squared divided by 2m, and now ap, ap dagger. So in this term, of course, what I can do, just to make it simpler, let me replace p to minus p. Yeah? It does matter, because it depends. I can write here, meaning that I replace here p to minus p. It doesn't change anything, yeah? because I sum over p, and changing the sign doesn't change the modulus. If P is below PF, minus P is also below PF. Huh? But now, following these things, yeah, I can rewrite, this is P above PF, and my A is exactly alpha, yeah, because then it's one. And this is zero. Yeah? So here it is sum of a P larger than PF, P squared minus PF squared over 2M, alpha P dagger alpha P. Yeah? Because for P larger than PF, we have alpha P is just identical to AP, and for P below PF, we have alpha P is identical to minus uh, A dagger minus P. Yeah? And now in the second term, I use this replacement. I write it plus sum over P less than PF, P squared minus P Fermi squared over 2M, and here I will have alpha P, alpha P dagger. It's almost, except for the order. Yeah? The order is wrong. I want to have alpha dagger alpha, which gives me the number of excitations. Yeah? 
But this, of course, I can use the anti-commutation relation. It's 1 minus alpha p dagger alpha p. Yeah? So what I get, I get some constant, which is a sum p less than pf, p squared minus pf squared over 2m. That's this unity. Yeah? Now this is exactly energy zero of the n particles minus mu n, epsilon Fermi n. This is just this constant, this one. And the rest, you see this minus, I can put in here and reverse. Yeah? So I will get then, not minus, I put here and I have pf squared minus p squared. So that means I can combine both terms, writing sum over p, modulus p squared minus pf squared over 2m, alpha p dagger alpha p. Now we diagonalize. It's indeed, it's the excitation energy, which is always positive, like what we studied before. Uh, and we put a ground state, okay, with this subtraction. An important point, which we also use, so here it's practically obvious, that these operators, alpha, are fermionic. So they also satisfy canonical anti-commutation relation. You can check it. You can check it. So they also like this alpha p1, alpha p2 dagger is the only non-zero one. The rest is zero. So these are fermionic operator. Yeah, we add in fermionic system, we add just one particle. There is no way to exchange, expect something bosonic. Yeah, it's an ideal gas. Yeah, there is no kind of tricks with bosonization, etc., which is a strong interacting one can happen right here. But you write it indeed, that's the first simplest example of a Bogolubov transformation when you go from initial atoms, initial particles, to quasi-particles or excitations. And this works it like this. And if you plot the spectrum, yeah, what happens? It's like this. So you have a quadratic curve, you put it down. This is your p squared minus pf squared over 2m. Yeah, this is your curve. Yeah, we put here. But then you simply flip this part. This is epsilon Fermi here, if you like. So you see, it's a gapless. It costs you no energy to create excitations. That's why Fermi, Fermi ideal Fermi gas, it's like the, the water surface. Yeah? All below has a constant density, yeah? but the surface is so, and you see some motion. It's exactly the case here. Yeah? So you can very easily create excitations with zero energy, et cetera, et cetera, and I think I should finish. So I finish. For today, I finish. So questions, if you are still have uh, energy. I hope these things, you most of the things you, you should know. I hope you know. Huh? I just want to have a, a good starting point for myself, just then to refer and to compare, et cetera, et cetera. OK. If no questions, the continuation will be tomorrow morning. Yes. Uh, this is also convenient because it's it's when you're dealing with a particle non-conserving systems, it's always convenient to fix 